keto freaks. Here's an update on Keto Fest. Keto Fest is a ketogenic festival for everyone. Richard Morris and I, along with a host of keto rock stars you probably know, are turning the entire coastal town of New London, Connecticut, ketogenic for a whole weekend next July. At least we hope it'll be next July. The actual date won't be confirmed until mid-January. You want talks by some of the hottest names in keto? Some of the best and brightest minds have already said they want to come, including Jimmy Moore, Megan Ramos, Ivor Cummins, Dr. Jeff Gerber, Dr. Eric Westman, and Dr. Ted Naiman. We hope to have a bacon bar going all day long during the talks. Knowledge and bacon. Ah. But we're going to do much more than sit in on these great talks. How about an outdoor pig roast? Cooking classes, fitness classes, walking tours, segue tours, and of course, live music and hanging out with fellow Ketonians. Several restaurants and bars in the neighborhood have offered up a special keto menu that includes low-carb potables, chicken wings, and fathead pizza. Wouldn't a fathead pizza truck be the best ever? Yeah, I'm talking a portable brick oven all weekend long. Well, we're going to have a Kickstarter in March to sell tickets. Meantime, add your name to the mailing list at ketofest.com. Ketofest, real keto for real people. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia, and I've been on a ketogenic diet for three years in April. Yeah. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. And within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 80 pounds and I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. Well, we've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. Sure do. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. Nope, it cannot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start podcast number 48, Starting Keto. Haven't we already started keto? <laughs> well, there's a lot of people that are just starting, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's a New Year's resolution time, so. Yeah, exactly. Well, Richard, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? Ah, uh, yeah. I, I was talking about our ketogenic forums, and I mentioned a discussion that uh, appeared about ventricular tachycardia, and it developed from just a random conversation, it was how, and I was talking about how cool it was that, that this had come up. But I... I called it ventral tachycardia. Oh. Uh, it's my bad. I meant ventricular tachycardia. Okay. Uh, my only excuse is that I was also talking about the brain's novelty center <laughs> that Facebook tickles so you don't notice the ads, and right. that's called the substantia nigra ventral segmental area. So I kind of mm. got my heart bits and my brain bits mixed up. So <laughs> probably a good thing I'm not a doctor. Huh? Yeah, right. Where's my scalpel? <laughs> <laughs> Doc, I got a pain in my stomach. <laughs> Uh, All right, well, before we go any further, let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is. Sure it's thing. any diet that puts you into a state of ketosis mm -hmm. where your body is burning fat for fuel rather than glucose That's predominantly. Right. Yeah. And generating ketones is a byproduct of that. To do that, the rules that we follow are the traditional ketogenic diet, which is we want 20 grams or less of carbs per day That's right. from green leafy vegetables, incidentals, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. We want to eat one to one and a half grams of protein for every kilogram of lean body mass that we have. 
And sure. you actually go even lower than that, right, Richard? I have been this this week. We're going to talk about this in uh, what I've done this week. Um, All right. But yes, um, for almost three years now, I've been between one and one and a half grams per kilogram of lean body mass, and that's worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, if you are an athlete and you're uh, building muscle, then you may need more. Uh, but really, uh, Certainly, if you if you're type two diabetic, you want to have as minimum amount of protein that keeps you in nitrogen balance, and yeah. then you get all of your energy from fat. You That's don't right. get your energy from carbohydrates or from protein. Yep. Protein is used for building the body. There are way more important things to do with protein than 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 burn it for fuel. That's right. The fuel is fat, and the fat could be on your body, uh, or it could be on your plate, and uh, sometimes it's a Krispy Kreme donut that you ate a decade ago. Right. And uh, don't let anybody tell you that you'll die without glucose or you'll die without sugar, because guess what? We have a right. gift. It's called gluconeogenesis. Sure. Your liver literally creates glucose for your brain, for your red blood cells, for your eye cells, mm -hmm. and just enough. And it's a demand-driven system. So yep. you don't don't worry about making too much, too little. It just happens. It's wonderful. It's a miracle. As you need it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. As long as you don't eat any, and that's the whole trick. That's the whole trick. Well, before we get started, buddy, how was your week? Yeah, it was good. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been uh, lowering my protein. So mm -hmm. uh, as you know, I got a DEXA scan done a couple of weeks ago, and that tells me what my baseline uh, lean body mass is. And for the month of January and half of February, I'm reducing my protein intake to the bare minimum that the Australian nutrient reference value for a 51-year-old man mm. um, gives, which is uh, 0.84 grams per kilogram of lean body mass and we okay. now know having done my deck so we know exactly what my lean body mass is so we can calculate that precisely okay. and so i'm 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 eating between between 60 and about 75 grams of protein per day and the other thing that i'm doing is i'm doing a food diary of everything that i'm eating so i know precisely what my protein is and from New Year's Day, I ate 50 grams, 66 grams, 63 grams, 65 grams, and 72 grams. So so how much is that? Like it, if you can put that into steak or eggs or bacon, can you give us a few examples of like what that might be? How much meat, for example? Sure. So for lunch on Tuesday, uh, I had uh, an egg, a large egg yolk. I didn't eat the egg white. Um, and I had uh, some 15 mils of pure cream and 10 grams of cheese, and I made an omelet out of that. So I had an omelet for lunch. Mm. And then for uh, for dinner, I had about 150 grams of salmon, which uh, turns out to be about 28 grams of protein. Nice. I had about 100 grams of ham, which turns out to be about 21 grams of protein. Mm. Um, I had a little bit of kimchi, uh, about 60 grams of kimchi, which turns out to be about two grams of protein. Mm. Um, I had uh, some cream with the kimchi, uh, about 30 mils of cream. No protein there. No protein. Well, actually, the, the cream does have uh, less than one uh, gram of, uh, of protein, and I, I just put in one gram into my fitness pal. Okay. For that. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, as a snack, I have some macadamia nuts. I have uh, 10 grams of macadamia nuts, which is about a gram of protein. Um, and uh, that was pretty much it for the day. But the interesting result from all of this is that my hunger has dropped dramatically. And my glucose has also dropped from – my glucose was averaging around about 5, 5.2. It's dropped to between 4.3 and 4.5. Mm. So it's it's been almost a, a 1 millimole per litre drop in glucose. And my ketones, which are normally uh, – physiologically, my ketones are you know between 0.2 and, and 0.8 normally. Um, they have uh, – they have – been around about one. Wow. So at least uh, I, I'm seeing a lot of positive results mm. about being becoming more ketotic um, by lowering protein. Um, and this is just for me. Yeah. Everybody's going to be different. Everybody's going to have a different res result. And it's really something that uh, you need to dial in for yourself. You need to find out what your lean body mass is um, and you need to set your protein levels. But um, this is going to be an interesting experiment for me because at the end of this process – 
And now remember, I'm eating what the uh, the guidelines say. Right. Uh, an Australian, the recommended daily intake of protein is for Australian an Australian male who's 51 years of age. Mm. At the end of this process, I'm going to get another DEXA scan, and that will tell me how much lean body mass I have gained or lost in that time. It's a great experiment. Well, no, for me, yeah. But I mean, the the, the range, the human range, is quite broad. Mm. Uh, we've spoken before about the science that shows that. Uh, that people maintain a nitrogen balance uh, between uh, 0.3 grams and 1.0 grams um, per kilogram of lean body mass. So, you know, it's a significant range. It's it's not like there is one number that works for everybody. Right. So, But, but we're, we're going to find out if this number works for me. That's so awesome. If I haven't lost any lean body mass, maybe I might even dial my protein down even lower, but I'm getting a really good result so far. This is great, Richard. And, you know, it, it may put a lot of fears to rest if you have a positive result in it. Either way, you're going to learn something. So I just think science is wonderful. And thanks for doing the experiment. No, I'm more than happy to. So how was your week, Carl? That was pretty good. I'm also eating less protein. And I guess I didn't realize how much less I'm eating. I'm not eating big steaks anymore. I'm basically having smaller meals and only two of them a day. And I do also, every once in a while, pop a few almonds. But uh, generally, I'm in good ketosis. I think my ketones were 0.7 last night. We were Skyping, right? And we were. I did mine. They were, they were 0.7. Well, this episode, as we said before, is for people who are new to the ketogenic diet. We don't want to overwhelm you a lot yet, but we will. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> before we do that, we have a little segment to get through, which we call... Mail! Mail! <laughs> mail! Oh, you know, I, I'm kind of getting a cold, so I got that very white voice, mail. You got, you got sexy phlegm. That's what you've got. <laughs> <laughs> Dot com. <laughs> no, don't go there, actually. I don't even know what I'm saying. So the first mail that we've got is from Sajeski. Okay. And uh, this was in our Facebook group. And the uh, post was, uh, last night I kept dreaming about gorging myself on cake. Not the good cake either. Oh. It's the kind from Safeway uh, <laughs> with the cheap frosting. Not very safe, is it? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't even like cake, she says. Uh. Anyone else dream about carbs when you're deep in the keto? I've heard this is normal. <laughs> yeah, it actually is. And you remember yeah. when my daughter Emmy was on the show, it was the newbies show. Sure which is a lot like this show, she said the same thing, that she had these dreams where she woke up feeling guilty yeah. because she had cheated, you know, and she had eaten some something sugary. Yeah. And I don't think I ever had those dreams or nightmares or whatever you want to call them, but... I, I definitely had these, and uh, I, I, I gave up smoking about 14 years ago, oh. and I was a dyed-in-the-wool smoker, so it was a very difficult addiction for me to break. And I had the same dreams as a smoker as I had uh, as a former carb carbaholic. Yeah. Uh, and I would, I would, I'm, a, I'm normally a heavy sleeper, and I would recognize in my dream that I was eating something with carbohydrates, and I'd be so disappointed with myself that I would shock myself out of sleep. Wow. <laughs> and I'd wake, I'd wake up guilty. Uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. That's, uh, but apparently, that's a thing. Yeah, uh, Daisy <laughs> mentions in the replies on this uh, thread, when I gave up smoking for the last time, I dreamed about stabbing people for two weeks solid. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank God it was just a oh, dream, dear. Daisy. Don't mess with yeah. Daisy. <laughs> Don't mess with Daisy. <laughs> but that speaks to something, though, that the dreaming about stabbing people, you know, the, the people get cranky when they go through yeah. carb withdrawal. and. I remember yeah. carb withdrawal, by the way, is a thing. Sometimes we call it keto flu. Sure We is. talked about it on the first yeah. show. And um, my, my wife looked at me and said, are you sure this is a good idea? Because I was ornery. <laughs> Well, we did, we both did it, so we we had a household of nasty people. Oh boy! So yeah, wow. But it didn't last very long, and we worked out what was happening, and we got to a really good place very soon. That's so, good. Um, and I don't think I've had a carb dream for uh, maybe that was the first six months. It certainly hasn't happened since. So yeah. I I think this is really this is 
This is a classic sign of addiction and breaking of addiction. Yep. And uh, once you get across over the cycle, I, I think those dreams may uh, disappear. Yeah. All right. Let me read one from our new forum, which is at ketogenicforums.com. Mm. Actually, you want to type www.ketogenicforums.com. This is a discourse forum. Mm -hmm. That's the name of the software we're using. Yeah. And uh, this is from somebody who's anonymous, and I, w I won't use her name or her screen name, but she says, I've been doing a keto diet for about two months. My macros are 5% carbs, 25% protein, and 70% fat, which I stay within quite nicely. Mm. I eat 18.6 most days, and that means 18 hours fasted, and then everything she eats every day is within a six-hour window, Sure, and that's called intermittent fasting and it really 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 works well um, for weight loss mm. she says but i do three 24-hour fasts weekly three now that's wow. a lot of that's a lot of time in a fasted state yeah she says the, but the only time i lose weight is doing an extended fast of seven days i've done three extended fasts before i went keto but I have lost no weight since going keto. In fact, I have more belly fat than I had before. Hmm. The only exercise I am doing is dog walking about 30 minutes a day. So I need to tweak something. I'm going to start Nautilus three times weekly and keep the dog walking. They insist. Has anyone had this problem and had any successful tweaks? And I'll go first with the answering, which is when you're starting keto, and I know she's been doing it for two months, Right. But when you're starting keto, it's probably a good idea not to exercise, especially if you're overweight, if you're Absolutely. obese. Absolutely, yeah. Because your body is changing hormonally, yeah, and uh, you probably won't have the energy to do exercise. Yeah, your ability to de deliver energy to your cells is uh, compromised because you've changed your substrate from glucose to fats, and your body needs to needs to become good at burning fat. Right. And it will, but mm. you just got to give it some time. Now, what's happening is 30 minutes a day of walking is building some significant muscle. Yeah. Which she says she has more belly fat than she had before. I don't believe it. I believe maybe it's just pushed out a little bit because her muscles are, are getting bigger. Um, but I can't believe that somebody who has, who eats those ratios and with an 18-6 window and three 24-hour fasts every week, it doesn't seem right. That's hardcore, that, and that's caloric restriction. And one of the things that uh, happens when people fast is between 24 hours and, and 72 hours, their bodies hit peak autophagy. And autophagy is the process of breaking down old, bent, misshapen proteins into the right. constituent amino acids uh, and basically, it's it's a it's a recycling process of going through and getting all of the old proteins in in your body and uh, reducing them to their to their basic ingredients. Yeah. And what happens is your uh, all your organs will shrink slightly during that stage because all of your organs are made out of protein. So you, you you're you're taking some of those uh, uh, proteins and, and, and breaking those down. And then immediately after your fast, you go through a feast state where you build all of those back up again. And I remember Jimmy Moore tells this story uh, that when he did his 21-day uh, fast last year, he had a DEXA mm. scan at the beginning and a DEXA scan at the end. And the DEXA scan at the end showed that he had apparently lost lean body mass through his uh, uh, midriff, basically where his organs are. Mm. And he was concerned about that. And he uh, went back and got another DEXA scan a few weeks after the fast had con concluded and he'd gone through so the feasting eating. state. Yeah and, yeah, and all of his lean body mass in that area had gone back up again. So what, is, what happens is when you fast, you turn on autophagy, which is very good for you. It's a recycling process, cleans all, right. the, all the old ugly proteins. And then at the end of the, f the fasting period, you go through a feast cycle where your body now – Builds up new proteins to go where those old ones were, and so right. um, so your organs shrink slightly, and then they expand back to their previous size. Mm. If she is just doing fasting, 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 what she's doing is caloric restriction. She what she she's not um, 
giving her body a chance to recover from those fasts. And uh, if she is just calorically restricting, what that does is it reduces your metabolic rate. So if you uh, if you calorically restrict and you don't lose weight, then what is necessarily happening is your metabolic rate is dropping. That One of the problems with keto is that you need to really ease into it. Yeah. If you go like a bull at a gate and try everything, I want to fast, I want to intermittent fast, I want to, mm. you know, I don't, I'm not going to go down to 20 grams of carbs, I want to go to zero grams of carbs, yeah. I want to go zero carb and eat meat only and and I'm going to chug – Bulletproof coffee and just eat meat, then that's what I'm going to do. Mm. Um, and, and I'm going to do a couple of marathons every week and, and, and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not going to work for you. Mm. What you, what you, the whole point of the ketogenic diet is to get your body into a comfortable state where it's able to draw down on your energy storage. Right. And, um, yeah, so, so, uh, all of these things are going to be pushing on her metabolic rate, which is going to make, uh, burning, en- burning stored energy a lot harder. So the advice that we can give, um, is to just eat. Yeah. Eat those macros. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, an IF window is good. You know, that's, that's good to do every day, but have two meals, you know, have one at the beginning of your window and have one at the end of your window. Yeah. I wouldn't start IF until she's, uh, until she's fat adapted. And you know that you're fat adapted when you wake up in the morning, you don't feel hungry. Yeah, that's right. So if you're waking up and you're feeling hungry, eat. <laughs> if you wake up and you don't feel hungry, don't eat. <laughs> It's yeah, very simple. It's pretty simple. Yeah. In fact, we've got a haiku, don't we? Well, you do. You wrote this haiku. Do you have it in front of you? I do. I, I memorized it. Oh, okay. <laughs> when you're hungry, eat. Mostly fat with some protein. Stop when you are full. Right. It's, it doesn't get much more simple than that. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. All right. There's one more piece of mail. Yeah. Uh, this one's a classic. This one that also came from our Facebook group, and this was John. And John wrote to tell us of a non-scale victory. An SV. An SV, that's right. And yeah. uh, he says, my computer and Windows 10 Hello no longer recognize me. <laughs> uh, and he, he says, I actually work for Microsoft, and we use Surface Books with video cameras for facial recognition to log in. Uh, this is a Windows 10 feature that any computer can do with the right camera. Well, after 10 weeks and almost 30 pounds of loss, I had to retrain Windows to know who I am. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> oh, I love it, John. Yeah, that's, that is outstanding. <laughs> and a little bit geeky. A little, that's fine. Is, we're, out, we're a little bit geeky too. Yeah. All right. Now let's get to the meat, so to speak, mm-hmm. of our show, which is for newbies. First of all, Congratulations. You've yeah. decided to take the plunge into a ketogenic diet. Maybe you saw what Richard and I were doing on Facebook. Maybe you have friends who are losing weight. Um, maybe you have friends who have reversed type 2 diabetes. Whatever the reason, uh, we, we are glad that you're trying it. Um, we need to say a couple of things mm-hmm. before you start. So if you've started already and you haven't done this, go do it now. Yeah. You want to talk to your doctor. You want to tell your doctor or ask your doctor permission to go on a ketogenic diet. If your doctor doesn't know what that is, you can uh, educate them, give them some information about it. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the critical science around saturated fat, cholesterol, and uh, sugar. That's right. And one of the best ways to educate your doctor is to buy them a copy of Stephen Finney and Jeff Volek's book, which was... written specifically for educating uh, doctors. And the book is called The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living. Yeah. And the other useful resource is Professor Timothy Noakes from South Africa has just released a paper uh, just this month in January of 2017, um, which gives details for medical practitioners of exactly why somebody would or would not go on a ketogenic diet and what all of the uh, requirements that as a physician they would need to do to manage that person's uh, experience on the diet. So that's also a great resource. We'll link that in the show notes. I would say that's a better resource than a book because when I gave my doctor a book and she flat out said, you know, I didn't read this because I'm a doctor, I'm busy, I don't have time to read this book. But papers, studies, 
You know, there's a blog post that I did that has three critical studies that show the efficacy and safety of a ketogenic diet. And uh, those are great to print out and bring to your doctor. Yeah. This uh, paper is uh, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, and it is in the 2007 January issue, volume 51, issue two. And the title of it is Evidence That Supports the Prescription of Low Carbohydrate High Fat Diets, a Narrative Review. So basically, it's a narrative that explains to physicians what they've got to look for and why they're patients would be going on this diet and what it's going to mean for them. So Great. definitely talk to your doctor. You want your doctor in your corner. Yes. This is something that Tom Norton says. Uh, you want your doctor in your corner when something's going wrong. So don't curse them out. Don't curse them out. Don't don't bring them Dr. Google and yeah. tell them what you saw on, on the internet. Give them scientific mm. papers so that they can see exactly what you're um, attempting to do for yourself. Right. So that's number one. Talk to your doctor. Number mm. two, get blood work done. Yes. Find out your starting numbers. Mm. And that means a full lipid panel. That means A1C, yep. which is a measure of your blood glucose over three months. Yeah. The way they do that is, uh, turns out red blood cells only live for three months. Yeah. And it measures the glycation or how sugar coated your red blood cells <laughs> are. And therefore that gives yep. you a good average over three months. Yeah. And the, the important thing there is that everybody's red blood cells live slightly different times. So the floor, the low level of HbA1c that you're going to have when uh, when everything is all working for you will be slightly different. Mine's 5.2. Um, I think Carl's is 5.5. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got people in our forum that are 4.8. And really the difference there is how long their red blood cells live. But that was a little bit too geeky. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. Mm. And also, if you are a type 2 diabetic taking insulin, yeah. you you need a little extra care done here. Or if you're taking medication to lower your glucose, metformin's fine because metformin's uh, method of action is to reduce the amount of glucose that your liver makes. Um, right. It's, it's drugs that lower the amount of glucose in your blood by causing you to urinate more out or uh, whatever method. Um, those drugs can overcorrect. So if you're on, going on a ketogenic diet uh, and you're on any uh, diabetic medication other than metformin, your physician will want to probably reduce that under management. So he'll probably want to have you testing and then reducing by half or Whatever schedule he 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 or she gives you um, to mm. uh, to reduce that, but most people will end up not needing uh, glucose lowering medication because they're just not eating sugar and starch, and that's where our body gets glucose from. And if you don't give your body glucose in the diet, it makes exactly what you need. And uh, to get back to the insulin, if you're a type two diabetic that yep. has only been taking insulin for a few years. Mm. Um, you actually may be able to get completely off of it. But uh, again, that is not for us to decide, not for you to decide, that's for your doctor to decide. However, if you've been taking it for a long, long time and you've had high blood sugar for a long, long time, there is a chance that your pancreas is no longer able to produce insulin. Yeah. So there is a chance that you have become uh, insulin dependent. That's right. And yeah. the ketogenic diet is still going to work for you. Mm. However, you may just need to take uh, some long-acting insulin at some level, yeah. but it's still going to work. Yeah. Now, Richard, what if you're a type 1 diabetic? Does the ketogenic diet do anything for you if you're type 1? Yes, there's a large community of people who follow Dr. Bernstein um, on uh on Facebook and that uh, will have a link in their show notes to that group and that's the type 1 grit group. Yeah. And he recommends a low-carb diet and the theory there is, okay, if you're a type 1 diabetic, you can't make insulin. Right. So when you eat something that requires insulin, if you eat protein or carbohydrates, you need to then inject yourself with insulin to cover that bolus of food. Yeah. So you basically have to calculate everything that you eat and then work out how much insulin to give yourself because your pancreas no longer does that. Right. So his theory uh, is that if you don't eat carbohydrates, then the only uh, insulin that you need 
is insulin to cover the amount that your liver makes. So mm. it's a much smaller number. It's a law of small small numbers, I, I believe he calls mm. it. Uh, but basically what it means is that if you are eating glucose and large amounts of protein and uh, you are a type 1 diabetic, then your glucose excursions, basically your glucose goes high yeah. and very low, um, uh, basically large swings. But if you are not eating starches and sugars and you're limiting your protein, then you will be having uh, less... Um, uh, Less swings and a more even, uh, yeah, and, even glucose. And you can see these kids with continuous glucose monitors on their arm. Uh, they can show you their glucose tracking uh, day by day, and you'll see they go they go for massive swings uh, to a very stable, you know, around about four point eight to five point two mm. range of uh, of glucose. And the important thing there is that all of the bad things that happen to diabetics. Uh, kidney disease, blindness, amputations, heart disease, all of those happen as you have more sugar in your blood, more, glu right. more glu glucose in circulation. Yeah. And so the more that you can reduce that and keep it to a low level, the less likely you are to have all of these horrible complications. So, mm. you know, it, it really turns diabetes from a really nasty disease to have to something you can manage and live with and, and thrive with. But I guess you're picking up on this mantra, we're not doctors, so we're not. talk yeah. to your doctor about that. We're just trying to explain a little bit of the science behind this. That's right. So then the question is, for the new listener, mm. what can I expect? How long is it going to take for me to feel and or see results? And the first answer is, well, remember the, the mail that I read? Yeah. You know, this is somebody who's been on it for two months, is really trying hard mm. and not losing weight. Um, in her case, Richard believes maybe she's fasting too much and not eating enough and her metabolic rate has gone down. But certainly we have seen mostly in women mm. where they follow the macros and they're getting enough calories and they're not calorie restricted. And yet it takes them a while to lose weight, even though they feel great. Um, there have been lots and lots of women who have come into our group into our groups, the Facebook group, the ketogenic forums that have all reported this phenomenon. Yeah. It takes women longer to start losing weight, even though they get the benefits of mental clarity, of feeling good, of high energy, really high energy, mm. almost right away. Yeah. Um, and uh, many times, and this is why I brought it up, many times what's happening is that hormones are shifting and settling and yeah. also lean body mass is building up which mm -hmm. is more dense than fat. Yep. And therefore, if you're losing fat at a slower rate than you're building muscle, you're going to gain weight. The scale is not really a good judge of how healthy you are, really. Right. Because as you say, you know, if you are changing your body composition from uh, more fat to less fat and less lean, mus lean body mass to more lean body mass, then you're going to be more dense. <laughs> and yeah, that's therefore, right. for the same volume, you're going to weigh more. Yeah, yeah. So these are all things to consider. Now, um, for men, they seem to just shed pounds. And uh, this it happens quite dramatically. It happens quickly. Um, what do I eat? This is the other big question. I want yeah. to know what to eat. Yeah. Well, we've, we've given you ratios, but that doesn't really translate to, to food. Richard did give you a, you know, a sort of a play-by-play -play of what he eats. Mm. But for somebody starting out, the most important thing is cut carbs, eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full. It doesn't matter if you're eating more protein when you start, nah. because that is going to make a dramatic difference even over carbs, right? Yeah. The, the most important thing is to cut your carbs and that will get you into ketosis. And once you're into ketosis, then all of the benefits start happening. So That's um, right. And, and the other important thing I would add, other than cutting carbs, is increase your salt a little bit. Now, we've all been told yes. for many years that salt causes hypertension, blood Blood, high blood pressure, basically. Uh, yeah. But when you go ketogenic, you you end up dumping a lot of sodium via your, via via your bladder. So uh, you really want to increase just so that the food tastes good. You don't have to go crazy and have eat really really salty food, um, but just have yeah. increase your food and use your taste and just try and turn off the switch that you 
have been running with for so long of reducing the salt in your diet and mm. putting in as much salt as you feel that you want to eat. And you probably find that you've your body has automatically set you to eat the right amount. So here's why this is weird for people. Because mm. we live with a diet, the standard American diet or the Western industrial diet, it's called, you know, our diet here. Yeah. For the last couple hundred years and more so in the last 20 years, yeah, it's yeah. just been way saturated with too many carbohydrates, too much sugar. Mm. And the result of that is that your kidneys retain salt yes. and water. And so that's why salt is bad for somebody who is eating this standard diet. Mm. Your insulin is abnormally high. Yeah. Your blood sugar is abnormally high. Mm -hmm. Your kidneys hold on to salt and water. Yeah. Okay. This is not a normal state. This is not normal. It's not healthy. Obviously, mm. the population is not healthy. Yeah. So when you go back to eating the way that humans have eaten for 99.9999999999% of their existence, mm. uh, which is meat, fat, you know, you live by the sea, you ate salt, yeah. fish, oils, this kind of thing. When that happens, your kidneys dump, as Richard said, salt, but also other electrolytes, mm. magnesium and potassium in particular. So a multivitamin is a good idea. Yeah. Also um, get Morton light salt, which has half sodium, half potassium. Sure. And if you want to take a magnesium supplement, that's a good idea too. Yeah. If you get cramps, I'd take a magnesium supplement. Um, that's yeah. probably, that's one of the things that uh, Dr. Finney says, one of the first questions she asks when people go onto a low-carb diet, have you ever had uh, a history of cramping? And if you yeah. have, he makes sure that they supplement magnesium, especially if they're type 2 diabetic. Apparently, type 2 diabetics in particular have very low magnesium levels. So um, he does mm -hmm. suggest that. Again, all of these things, you should mention to your doctor what you're going to do. But um, right. th this was something that, that I did and it worked for me. I would get uh, cramps in my calves and in my feet when cycling. And as soon as I increased magnesium uh, in the, the water that I take when I go cycling, uh, they all went away. I also sometimes mm -hmm. uh, soak my feet in Epsom salts, which also gets magnesium into your body through your skin. So um, that's also another technique. But yeah, magnesium supplementation. And magnesium is also present in anything green. Yeah. So spinach, broccoli, kale, all yeah. of those things have magnesium. If it's green, it's got magnesium. Yeah. That's probably something we should talk about food. I mean, the 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 question of what foods you can eat on a low-carb diet, uh, there right. are a lot of vegetables that uh, you can't eat on a low-carb diet. Like sure. any vegetable that is essentially below the ground is a storage. Tubers. It's tubers or carrots or um, uh, uh, Ginger and uh, ginger is probably not so bad, but most of the most of the other certainly potatoes, they're all storage tubers or storage um, reservoirs of energy. And the energy mm. that and the way that plants predominantly store energy is as starch, and starch is a carbohydrate. Yeah. So um, these yeah. things are designed by by plants. They've evolved to be great stores of carbohydrate energy. That's their body fat. That's right. That's kind of like a plant's <laughs> body fat. And the leaves yeah. uh, have very little of this uh, uh, starch in because they are photosynthetic organs. And, and so the, the leaves of uh, plants like spinach and kale and uh, all the cruciferous vegetables mm. like uh, cabbages, cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels, Brussels sprouts. sprouts. These are all wonderful um, uh, vegetables to eat on a low-carb diet. And as Carl mentioned, the green ones, the very dark green ones like kale, have got more magnesium in. So, you know, and they've got potassium in as well. So mm. you want to try and minimize the amount of supplements that you have. Yeah. If you've got a very nutritious diet, you're not going to need to um, have a lot of supplementation. Mm. But one thing that you should have measured when you get your blood done is vitamin D. Yeah. It turns out many of us are deficient in vitamin D and you might need to take a supplement there. Yeah, that's true. Um, Especially during the winter time, you might need to because we make vitamin D when we expose our skin to, to sun, we turn cholesterol into vitamin D. So, All right. So back to what to eat. When we interviewed Dr. Ted Naiman, he says, I tell all my patients to just go eat bacon and eggs for two weeks and come yeah. back and see me. 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> bacon's very nutritious and so are eggs. Yeah. And it's got all the salt. So I would say bacon, good. You know, eggs fried in butter. We, uh, we like Kerrygold grass-fed butter. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, grass-fed uh, oils and fats have more omega-3s in them, which is uh, something that you need more of. And uh, maybe a little cheese in there and some spinach and garlic. You could eat that every day for breakfast and then not eat again until you're hungry. Yeah. Which is probably going to be in the afternoon sometime. Mm. And if dinner time comes around and you're not hungry, don't just eat. don't eat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not rocket science. Nope. Yeah. So, and you can even eat breakfast, the breakfast meal, um, three or four, uh, two or three times a day. I mean, you can, there's, there's nothing wrong with eating bacon and eggs for breakfast and dinner. Yeah. Now, let's talk about some of the more delicious recipes that we've mentioned on this show. Okay. Um, At my house, I do a lot of fried foods with a keto breading. And you might ask, what is that? Mm. That is, uh, in a food processor, crush up three parts pork rind to one part Parmesan cheese or grated Mm. cheese. Pork rind. Make that very fine powder. (laughs) And you don't need any uh, egg wash or anything. Nice. Just take some... uh, flattened chicken thighs. So you just press the meat into the into the yeah. rinds, parmesan and mix and wow. Yeah. Nice. Put about a half inch of olive oil in a in a pan and heat that up over medium heat. Yeah. And uh sizzle away. And now you got chicken parm. And you know what we do then is we take sliced mozzarella and put that over that and under the broiler for a little mm, bit. Nice. And, uh, <laughs> there is actually a tomato sauce that we use. It's Rouse R A O apostrophe S. Mm-hmm. And uh, half a cup of this stuff has about three grams of carbs. Right. So in a limited amount, that's perfectly fine. But that chicken parm is is a staple at my house. And if you're in Australia, you can get uh, fountain low carb or low sugar uh, tomato sauce and barbecue sauce, and they're both perfectly good. Yep. I remember when I started, I had a lot of beef short ribs in a pressure mm. cooker or I a slow cooker. I love my cooker. pressure cooker. Oh, so yeah. good. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, you're going to hear some more about a, a technique that Richard and I have been doing for a while called sous vide. Mm. Uh, and this is a way to make meat extra, extra, extra delicious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go to our recipe archive at recipes.2keto.com to see all of the recipes that we've shared. Yep. Um, they're amazing. And uh, there's this idea that People can't stay on a ketogenic, a low-carb diet because it's boring and I'm going to get bored of the foods. No, 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 All the flavor is in the fat. You'll actually get to a point where you look back at the food that you used to eat and you're going to recognize all of the starches, the all of the white stuff, the potatoes, the French fries, the bread, the pasta. You're going to look back at it and it's going to you're going to think it's like eating packing peanuts. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's not food. Right. It's a packaging material, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's the stuff that food comes with. <laughs> used, used to come with, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. Uh, and that also brings us to the word faith. Okay. You do have to take a leap of faith. And it's very scary for a lot of people starting out because, let's face it, our bodies here, you're never going to eat bread again. Yeah. And we think, oh, no. But I like bread. <laughs> I love bread. I can't give it up. Here's another one, chocolate. Well, we oh, eat yeah. chocolate. We do. We eat chocolate. Chocolate's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Just no sugar. We just don't just don't have a, any or a lot of sugar in it. I eat, I get um, 86% chocolate squares, and I'll have one of those every day. And mm. I stay in ketosis. Mm. No problem. Nice. Yeah. So, so... Just take the leap of faith to realize that you need to change your metabolism. Your body is fundamentally changing. Hormonally, your body is fundamentally changing. It will no longer desire all the crap that you're used to eating and you think that you're going to die if you don't have. (laughs) That's exactly right. It's just an illusion. Yeah. It's an illusion. Yeah. So good luck and go to our forums, www.ketogenicforums.com. Join the conversation. Uh, you know, ask your newbie questions there, and there's a lot of great people who will help you out. And as an example, we uh, asked a question in the ketogenic forums today, telling everybody that we were going to do this special, and we asked people for some tips and tricks for new people uh, that are just joining the 
uh, ketogenic lifestyle. And uh, we can read out a few of these. Yeah, let's do it. So um, uh, Bacon, <laughs> I'm going to give the user names uh, and uh, okay. from the forum. We have a user on the ketogenic forums called Bacon. I think we should just stand and give this guy a round of applause because that's awesome. <laughs> so Bacon says, trust the science, eat real food, and be patient. And that's really yeah. great advice. And uh, Jay Frick says, kiss, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid, shut out all the noise clutter. And, nice. Wow, that's so true. Yeah, don't don't fret over it. I mean, if you're hungry, this is what I did. I made a pound of bacon whenever I was short on bacon, put it in the fridge, and whenever I got hungry, took a piece of that bacon out, slather a little cream cheese on it, oh, boom. Yeah. And if cream cheese is too bland for you, okay, yeah. go get some pate. Yeah. Smoke salmon cream cheese. Mm. Some liverwurst. Something you can use that bacon as a cracker for. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, eventually you're not going to snack. Eventually you're not yep. going to need to snack. And this whole theory that we need three squares a day or, you know, these days they're even saying for people who are diabetic, you should be eating six meals a day, all small mm. meals. You've got to have like 50 grams of carbohydrates in every meal. No. All nope. of that is a recipe for making your di- type 2 diabetes worse. That's really right. you don't need to be eating all the time. You need to be eating to fuel your body and to give your body the raw materials it needs to build itself. Mm -hmm. And then you need really, ultimately, you're going to be fasting for part of the day um, because you're not hungry, because you you have internal reserves. You've you've either eaten a a meal and and provided circulating uh, lipids for your body to run on or you're getting them out of body fat. So um, ultimately, you're not going to be eating, you're not going to be snacking six times a day, but when you first start, you're going to be still eating using the same pattern because right. you're locked in the mode of thinking it's breakfast time. I've got to have breakfast. Yeah. It's lunch time. I've got to have lunch. That's okay. That's fine. And, and when just, you start out, eat yeah. as much as you want. Yeah. And, you know, eat as much. Eat, eat until you're full. So Brenda says, uh, just get through the first week. You may not yeah. feel well for a few days as your body adjusts. You may feel yep. fatigue or have headaches. Supplementing sodium eliminates most symptoms. Mm. Get through those first few days of early fat adaption. The amazing, glorious high that awaits on the other side is hard to describe, <laughs> but you will want to stay there. Oh, yeah. Do this for yourself and do not seek approval from anyone else. Good. There will be those who discourage you. Trust the science to reassure yourself and do your research. Above all, be kind and patient with yourself. Keto is not a quick fix, but right. a long-term project. Amen. But but what an amazing experiment of one it is. To me, it's a miracle. My yeah. type 2 diabetes no longer exists. Yep. I used to have an A1C of 12 and triglycerides of 1,200. Now my lab tests are normal. Keto is amazing. It's really true. What a testimonial. Yeah. yeah so – you're, unless you came from Mars or something, you probably have the same human physiology that we all have. Yeah. You just have to trust it that it's going to uh, heal itself, keep on top of things, keep on top of your sugar, keep on top of your electrolytes, and above all, eat fat when you're hungry. Mm. So that's a bunch of uh, strategies and words of encouragement from people who've been in ketosis for two, three years. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some of them are six months, uh, and uh, all of us are starting to see the benefits of this. Uh, I I can certainly echo Brenda's comments. It's really, it's turned my type 2 diabetes totally around. And I'm on top of my appetite. I'm on top of. how I feel my body, how I run my body. So um, for me, it's remarkable. So I can highly recommend the ketogenic diet. And I suggest to people who are starting with New Year's resolutions that the best time to start is right now. Right now. Yep. Go make yourself some bacon and eggs. (laughs) (laughs) And butter. And butter. Extra butter. (laughs) All right. So that brings us to the last segment of our show, which we call... Recipes! Recipes. <laughs> recipes. So, Carl, how about you give us a recipe? All right. My recipe is for leftovers. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> leftovers are the things that nobody ever wants to touch. We end up wasting a lot of food in my country anyway. And, yeah, it is. And we, I used to, I used to waste a lot of food at my house, but... This was uh, a use for a, some leftover prime rib 
that y- utilized three kitchen gadgets. Now, kitchen gadgets for me and or kitchen appliances, I consider a medical expense. Okay. That's reasonable. Because, you know, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And this is exactly what we're doing. We're healing ourselves with medicine. That's true. You wouldn't complain if your doctor said, oh, you need to pay $150 for this particular device because you need it to live. Right. And you need it to be healthy. So... Mm. So, what I'm saying is, go spend some money on uh, some kitchen <laughs> gadgets, clear out your pantry of all carbohydrates, get rid of it all. Yeah. You're not going to want them. The more you have, the longer it's going to take you to get into it. Mm-hmm. So, I had some prime rib left over from uh, dinner and complete with jus, mm-hmm. au jus, yeah. right? Au jus. I love how yep. people say with au jus, because <laughs> au means with. with. <laughs> and, yeah. Complete au jus. Yep. So I cut it up into bite-sized cubes, and I split it up into two gallon-sized Ziploc bags, because that's how much of it I had. And then I used a cold smoker. And Richard, you have one of these too. It's a polyscience. Yeah, the polyscience. Yeah, handheld smoking gun food smoker. It's 100 bucks on Amazon, mm-hmm. and uh, it comes with wood chips, and it looks like a looks like a marijuana pipe. It's you know, kind just of like does, a big doesn't it? <laughs> kitchen bong. But what it has is it has a bowl and there's a fan that sucks air into the device. Yep. It sucks the smoke from the chips that you light. Mm-hmm. And you light those in the bowl. You basically put some chips in the bowl, right. you light it, and the fan sucks air through those chips. So it's basically smoke and down through a tube. And the tube goes into the bag. Okay. So I have the Ziploc bag and I have the tube poking in one side of it. Mm-hmm. And I've got it as tightly controlled in there so the smoke doesn't escape. Nice. You flatten the bag because Mm -hmm. this thing's going to fill it up with smoke, which is volume. It'll inflate. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to do by yourself, but I have usually have one hand holding the tube in place and kind of sealing it. Mm. And then with the other hand, I quickly turn on the smoker and then quickly light the bowl. And you, you, you only want to do this until the bag inflates. And therefore, you only want to use a little pinch of yeah. wood chips. Yeah. You don't really need a lot, you know, maybe a eighth of a teaspoon, I'm thinking. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So then you pull it out and seal the bag, and now you've got what looks like a bag full of smoke. Right. <laughs> What's really fascinating about this, Richard, is how quickly that smoke gets absorbed into the food. Mm. It goes away, and it doesn't exit the bag. Wow. Where does it go? Yeah. It goes into the food. Into the smoke the food. particles go into the food. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So so I you, I like to tumble the bag around and mix it up a little bit. And then maybe after five minutes, all the smoke is gone. So guess what? Hit it again. Hit it again. And then hit it again. I Absolutely. do mine three times. I do the same when I smoke butter. Yeah. But I put it in the fridge between hits. Oh. Uh, and so it it basically it's it's cold smoking, mm. and you just cut your butter up into cubes, and then you hit it with smoke and put it in the fridge so that mm. it stays in cube shape, and yeah, do it three times, and then after that you then use that butter in a sauce to monte your sauce. Oh, what a great idea! It's delicious. Smoked <laughs> tomatoes are also amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got these one inch cubes of uh, beef. Medium rare prime rib, yeah. Lovely, yeah. Yep. Okay, so and all of the sauce gets the smoke flavor too. And that's the the really amazing thing is that the jus gets smoky. Okay. Nice. So now I have another gadget called a food saver. Okay. And this is an automatic vacuum sealing system. And um, this is also about a hundred bucks, maybe uh, Amazon Prime, one hundred and forty bucks, and it's great. You basically it comes with a a roll of bag that you slice off and seal one end of it. It's like a giant tube, right? And you seal a giant tube. Cut it up. You seal off one end, and then you put your food in. You put your food in, and then seal it up, and it takes all the air out of it. And then you can take this and make portion sized or two portion size if you live with somebody like I do, mm-hmm. you know, make little portion bags, throw it in the freezer. And then whenever you want one of these, well, that begs the question, how do I reheat food from the freezer right. without overcooking it the second time? Sure. Cause you've got a perfectly medium rare. You don't want to cook it anymore. Absolutely. You just want to heat it up to medium rare, not any higher. Yeah. Well, it turns out there's a way to do that. Okay. And it's called the Anova sous vide stick. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. I got one of these for Christmas too. <laughs> yeah. And my, res- my recipe today is going to be using one as well. Right. In fact, a lot of us got these for Christmas because they were on sale. A lot of people are using them. Uh, it's cheap. And I think mine was under two hundred dollars, but yeah. I didn't buy it, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. But it's about two hundred bucks. Santa bought yours. Richard Campbell bought mine, actually, <laughs> my good friend and business partner. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so here's what it is: it's a, a stick that attaches to the side of a pot, and the pot doesn't go on the stove. The stick has a heating element that goes down inside the pot, and it also has a, a thermostat. Mm-hmm. And you plug in the temperature that you want. And it maintains, you fill it with water and it maintains the water at that temperature. And it circulates the water all the time. So it doesn't rely on convec- convection to get the temperature co- correct. Yeah. That's right. It has a circulator or mm. a, a turbine, basically. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's rotating the water, it's heating the water, mm. and it's me- constantly measuring the temperature and adjusting the heating element. Yeah. You use any pot that the thing will fit into and just, uh, you know, set it to 135 Fahrenheit, which is a perfect medium rare. And I've had a chuck roast recipe, sous vide recipe mm-hmm. on uh, recipes.2keto.com that I use the dork food device for. Right. Yeah, I remember that one. The dork food device uses a crock pot. It's about $100. Yeah. And you plug it in and you plug the crock pot into it. You set the temperature and then it turns the crock pot on and off to maintain a constant temperature. And it's pretty good. Yeah. But it clicks. It's got a relay. Right. And so it's constantly clicking on and off. That'd be and annoying. It's kind of annoying. Yeah. And this doesn't require a crock pot. It doesn't right. require any other heat source. So if you take it from the freezer, drop it in a 135 water bath for maybe 30 minutes, mm. it's done. Yeah. Nice. And the interesting thing about sous vide meat, I always thought that the amount of doneness in a steak it was determined by how long you cooked it. But it's actually yeah. determined by the temperature that the center of the steak gets to. Absolutely. And if you have a hot griddle and you put a steak on a hot griddle, you have a one-inch steak, that temperature has to propagate through half of the uh, half an inch of the meat. And so, so that's half of it's going to be overdone. Yeah, exactly. So that's the that's the timing element of uh, cooking meat to the right doneness is you're mm. basically trying to balance it so that the middle of the meat is perfect and the outside of the meat you're willing to sacrifice and it'd be overdone and grey. Right. Whereas with a sous vide, you're actually cooking the entire one inch thickness of that steak to the temperature for the doneness that you want. So the entire thing yep. from edge to edge is all yeah. perfect, medium, rare. So. Yep. And then, of course, you, I didn't never even thought of that, but when you're reheating stuff, you just reheat it at the same temperature. The same temperature. It never yeah. goes above that. The only the only meat that you probably couldn't do that with is fish because fish has right. – fish can't be sous vide for hours on end because no. there's an enzyme that breaks down the, the, the proteins in the, in, the, in the flesh. So it becomes right. a very nasty uh, texture. But uh, yeah. uh, see so – we, I've been eating salmon the whole the, the past week, all sous vide, and uh, I cook it for like twenty minutes, and it's absolutely perfect. Yeah, fifty five degrees Celsius, twenty minutes, perfect salmon. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So that's what I got. It's uh, gadgets to the rescue for leftovers, and you know, not just for leftovers. You're going to be seeing a lot of uh, sous vide stuff yeah. from us. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do a sous vide recipe today. Previously, you've spoken about having a perfect egg in Amsterdam, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. And that was a 63-degree egg? Yeah. 63 Celsius. And uh, so you had that recipe. And now I'm going to improve on that recipe. One of the things I did when I got my first sous vide was I tried the 63-degree egg. And what ended up happening was the white was watery. Yeah. Well, it, it, it was white. It wasn't clear, which is yeah. you know, egg white is clear when it's raw. It's loose. So it wasn't raw, but it was like it was loose. It was watery. Mm. So I learned a technique. Uh, what you do is you get a pot on the boil and you boil the egg for three minutes mm. and that sets the white and then you you ice shock it. So yeah. you basically have a bowl, a bowl with some ice and some water in it. So after you've boiled it for precisely three minutes and the white is now set, you drop it in the – in the ice bath. Stops and the that cooking process. It. That stops the cooking process. And now you sous vide it 
at 63 degrees for two hours, for 45 minutes. Oh, 45 well, minutes. I 45 minutes is 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 how I like. It. This will determine how the yolk will be set. Right. And I like the yolk to be runny like a sauce. But okay. if you, if you, you want the yolk to set up. You can you can an do hour it for, to two hours two yeah. hours yeah yeah and you don't need to put it in a plastic bag in fact it's not legitimately sous vide because the word sous vide means under vacuum mm. and you just put eggs straight into the sous vide straight into the water you know into the circulating yeah, water yeah they kind of have their own container don't they they do <laughs> they do uh, so um, one thing I noticed I I di- I did this once. And the eggshells broke slightly and a little bit of the egg white came out in the boiling water. Ah. And when I made the egg, when I cracked it open, there was a void in there that had the egg floating on the surface. So right. that wasn't the best. You, you don't want to do this with cracked eggs. You want whole uh, whole shells. The way to avoid that is that you can not use re- boiling water that's on high. In mm. other words, when it boils. A rolling boil. Yeah. yeah, put it down to medium or just as high as it needs to go and still boil. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea. So so I do my 63-degree 63, 63 egg and I peel it and the, the white is set. And nice. so I can then take that and put it on a plate and that's delicious. Now, what I'm going to put it on, I'm going to use something called baconized ham. Ooh. So here's how you bake it. Here's how, here's how you baconize ham. Uh, you fry it in lard. All right. <laughs> so, lard. so you get some yeah lard. Isn't that going to clog my arteries, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> Not my arteries, it isn't. Uh-huh. So so I just use like a teaspoon of a teaspoon of lard in a really hot cast iron yeah. pan, and I dice up some ham. This is um, homemade ham. I, okay. I mean, you could probably use sliced ham from the store, but it's not a. It's not as nice. You want a home, a nice thick slice of homemade ham, and I dice it up into half inch dice. Okay, and I put that in the pan with the lard that's just uh, cooking, and uh, I I basically caramelize all the surface of it, and it basically turns into like little bacon bacon croutons or <laughs> almost. Ooh. So. Now, I also have some – in my fridge, I have some uh, stock left over from making a ham bone stock. Oh, yeah. So when I made my ham, I pulled the bones out, chuck them in the pressure cooker with an onion and some bay leaf and, and, and basically cooked that for 10 hours in, nice. in, a, in, a, in an instant pot, <laughs> in a yeah. not-so-instant pot. Right. And uh, so I've got this ham bone stock. So I, I take the baconized ham and I put it in a bowl and I add a little bit of this uh, – Ham bone stock, maybe two teaspoons, two tablespoons, and I add a little bit of the ham bone stock, maybe two tablespoons, and I, and this is this to the hot baconized ham, and what that ends up doing is it ends up uh, yeah. hydrating the base of it, and then I just put the egg, this sixty three degree egg. Obviously, yeah. I have to peel it. The peeling is a is a difficult process, but uh, if you're lucky, you're going to get the peel off all uh, without too many divots in your egg. And I just drop this egg on top of that. And now this egg, because I've only cooked it for forty-five minutes, the egg, the egg yolk, is like a nice hot runny sauce. And oh, as soon man. as you slice through that egg, it just sauces all of that baconized ham. Oh, so now, good! <laughs> now that's what you call a keto meal. <laughs> that is boring keto, my boring friend. Boring keto, it is. So that's my that's my recipe. Yeah. Well, that brings us to a request. Mm. Richard and I think that Anova, that makes this sous vide stick that we have fallen in love with, yeah. would make a great sponsor they would. for Two Keto Dudes. They would. But, you know, just us saying, hey, come check out my podcast, that isn't enough to convince them. No. So, we want you to send Anova an email. Mm. Send it to info at anovaculinary.com and say, please sponsor- Two Keto Dudes. Two Keto Dudes. This is a great show. I'm learning so much about cooking. I love sous vide, all that great stuff. And we heard about your product from them. And we heard about your product from them. We think you should be a sponsor. You can tell them you, you, can tell them you hate us. We don't care. <laughs> yeah, we don't care. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, just send them mail. Send them mail. Remind them of Two Keto Dudes regularly. That's right. These guys won't shut up until you, uh, until you sponsor them. We think it's a great fit. 
We do. So that's the show, Richard. That's awesome, Carl. Good luck to everybody just starting keto. Yeah. And thank you for everybody who gave us uh, tips and tricks for uh, beginners starting keto. Yep. Of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, or uh, some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website or on the ketogenic forums. Absolutely. You can follow us on Twitter at 2 Keto Dudes, mm-hmm. on Instagram at 2 Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join our forum, it's www.ketogenicforums.com or forum.2keto.com. Well, keep calm and keto on, Richard. Yeah, keep calm and keto on, Carl. All right. And we'll see you next time on 2 Keto Dudes. <laughs>